Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm in studio with my intrepid partner and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, a.k.a. The Doctor. We also have Ben in the house. How you doing? On the wheels of steel. Roberto was in here earlier helping us get set up. I don't know if he's going to jump in. But anyhow, we're uh, really excited about our special guest this afternoon. We have Frank Fiordolino on the show. And uh, Frank and I were just talking off air about the the labyrinth of relationships, how we are related <laughs> through marriage. So we're going to get into that, the history of his family, the history of the Bucciolato family, talk about our common ancestry and going back to Sicily. But um, Frank was someone who was born in Sicily, immigrated to New York, and because of his family heritage and lineage, ended up becoming part of the, uh, or at least affiliated, associated with the Bonanno family in New York. So he's had a very interesting life, and uh, he's going to share some of that with us. We're going to talk about, about his off, experiences. About authenticity here yeah. uh, at the Original Gangsters podcast. We go straight to the source. Yes. People like Mr. Uh, yeah. Fiordolino, who uh, lived yes. it and, and you know, lived a movie script. I mean, that's what we say a lot of times when we bring these guys on, that they're actually like living out uh, this surreal existence. And then if they get out on the other side of it and they can provide insight or perspective to people like us, um, it's, it's, it's really special. So thanks Frank for, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks Frank. Thank you for having me guys. Um, good evening. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I've never, I never looked at his movie script at all. Matter of fact, it was like um, I was always fascinated with the movies, especially gangster ones. And, and, and it's funny; it was, they talk about art imitating life. Um, me and my friends growing up, it was more like life imitating art, you know. So what We'd do you go to the movie? What do you mean by that? Like I'm you, sorry? you, you, you guys like we internalize movies and imitate what? That's what we wanted. We wanted to, well, you know what I mean. Yeah, we were watching art. We were gonna, like they say, you, you know, people get get offended sometimes when they have these mob movies and certain Italian groups. That, and and fair enough, I get it. They're like they make us look bad, and people go, "Well, it's art imitating life." We were doing, we were doing it the other way around. We were watch that and say, well, "That's what we want to do." You know, we want to rob that bank. We want to kill that guy. We want to become. Um, we want to be, become as big as Paul Dario in uh, Goodfellas. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I, other researchers have referred to this as the Godfather effect, that once the Godfather movies yeah. came out, they started, real wise yeah. guys started internalizing the, what and they it's saw. It's cyclical. Screen. It's cyclical, because when it all started, when Hollywood first fell in love with the gangster movie genre, it really was sure. art imitating life. And then... As the years went on and and pop culture evolved and and like Frank is saying, by the time the the seventies and eighties hit, it was you were going to the theater and then trying to act out what they were telling you. When initially, right. sixty years before that, it around. was the the paradigm was was reversed. Right for most people, uh, most people a little bit older than myself, it was The Godfather, and I'm fifty two years old. For me, it was Goodfellas. You know, I came out of that movie theater. I was like, God, I want to be like these fucking guys, you know? <laughs> no, it was, it was like, I, I, I it, that was it. I was brainwashed. They had me. No, I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I remember being Italian American, you know, growing up teenager, seeing that movie. And, um, and there's a lots of links between the Vario crew, the Lucchese crime family, and then the Bonanno group that Frank came from. Oh, yeah. Uh, they worked together on the famous Lufanza heist. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, Bruno Indelicato, who recently just got out of prison, right. uh, was married to Jimmy the Gent's daughter. That is correct. I went to school with his younger son. You got to remember, he had two kids, Frank and Jesse. I went to school with Jesse. Frank was murdered later on. Uh, Jesse's a good kid. Uh, he, he, where where uh, it seemed like Frankie took more of his dad's uh, path in life where Jesse did not, you know? Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where everybody lived in. So, like, back to, like, watching Goodfellas coming out of, I think it was, like, 1990, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I come out of that movie theater, and I didn't need a stage because it was already set. The characters were there. The actors were there. All I had to do was fuck the damage. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. To, to tell us about that environment. I mean, let, give our audience like paint a picture for them, because I think that's a really interesting way to put it, that the the stage was already set. But what, what do you can you expand on that? Oh, high school was was like what a what a surreal, surreal experience. I, I, I go to high school in 19 in 1985. And, and then I always say that Gotti Gotti breaks out. Gotti mania is just but and not only that, I'm going to school with two of his kids, the kids from his neighborhood, from the newspaper boy to the, 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 whoever, you know, uh, has some kind of a uh, connection. Uh, uh, not only that, I went to a school where a lot of made people's kids went to Genovese kids, Colombo kids, you know, um, they all went there. So with the Gotti era, I came from a very, very secretive, like, yeah, this is what our family my at that, I'm figuring it out at 15. Pretty good. This is what we're into, so we don't talk about it. Well, yet I'm looking at the other end of the lunchroom, and I'm seeing these kids double kissing and doing things like <laughs> if you double kissed a year before, they might think you were, and nothing wrong with that. They might <laughs> thought you were gay or something, but that's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Right. But uh, not, you know, all this Hollywood was coming out by the time we we were so consumed with. The mob. By the time Goodfellas came out, you got this five years from '85 to '90. That that the show was on 24/7, from the nightclubs to the streets to the everybody. Everybody was uh, we, 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 it was like showtime. And just think about the difference between, you know, like, like I think it's a great way to to illuminate this um, phenomenon yeah. because he's talking about from '85 forward. 85 to 90 that, you know, Gotti blasts onto the scene in 85 by killing Castellano. Right. The Guido tuxedos. Right. Goodfellas comes guy, out in 1990. Know. But think about the difference between go back to 1975 and then go from 75 to 85, 75, Carlo right. Gambino's still alive. The old school. And, you know, he's the face of yeah. organized crime old guard. in, in New York city, in America. Then just 10 years later, 1985, like, uh, Frank said, you know, the, the, the Gotti phenomenon, uh, explodes and the, the entire way that the mob does business, the entire way that the mob is perceived, it all kind of turns on its ear in, in a matter of a, a, a couple months, maybe, you know, between Gotti taking over in late 85 to, you know, the rest of the eighties, 1990 Goodfellas comes out and guys like Frank then are just kind of off and running. Yeah. And I don't get me wrong. I was I, back then. I was in awe. My eyes were wide open. It was like, man, this is one badass motherfucker. I'm talking about John Gotti. But taking 60 years back, you know, you had people trying to hide things all the time, not trying to make it known that this is this life existed. And here he is saying it does exist, and you're looking at it. Yeah, I mean, he was you really know? unapologetic about that. Um, and he, he, I think he deliberately wanted a new paradigm that, uh, no more hiding in the shadows, you know, Carlo Gambino or remember Sopranos when he was, he say junior with his moldy sweaters, <laughs> you know, living in a nondescript right. house. Like we want to, God, it's in your face, well, at least in the movie, in your face, Cosa Nostra. Well, well, I'll give you, I'll give you James, 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 for example, is, uh, is, uh, Great. This would be his great cousin, who's a uh, Filipino Butchelado or Joe Butchelado. Used to be in Nicaragua area, a high-ranking member of the Bonanno family. You you could pass this guy if you didn't know him a hundred times, and he did not give you one inclination that he was part of any criminal organization. Forget about the mob. And and he was a very powerful man. Him, his family. They go back to. They're actually one of the pioneers of organized crime. In my in my town of Castella Mata del Golfo, and, and them along with the Boventry family, you know, Joe Banana always tries to put that on himself that his family was one of the pioneers of of um, and he got it half right of of the mob in my town, it, half right because his mother was a Boventry. Joe Banano's um, 
mother was. Am I correct, James? Yeah, that's correct. And and let, let me set this up a little bit because I don't really talk about this on this show, but some of our audience members may have read my book where I talk about the Bucciolato family. I, I don't really talk about it on the podcast, so some of our members, audience members may not be aware of this, but the Bucciolato family has, has a history in this topic and uh, including, you know, my own relatives and, um, we trace our history back to the town of Castellamare del Golfo in Sicily, and uh, so does Frank. That's where his family's from. Frank himself was actually born there. But a number of other prominent members, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, families uh, in Cosa Nostra also come from Castellamare. You may recognize some of these names, Bonanno, Magadino, Bonventre, and there's several others. So that's a good point of departure Adarello here. Adarello happens to be uh, oh, right, political. Yeah. He actually happens to be the president of Italy today. Um, he's more of an anti-mafia guy these days. But his his dad was a, uh, I guess, I'm fair to say, a little bit of a crooked politician, if you will. And one of the most powerful in Sicily. Yeah, and he made, uh, some research indicates that he, he was actually a made member yeah. himself. But that's, that's you know. That, that's correct. And it's, it's, it's likely, but right. Sergio Mattarella. Um, who's the president of Italy right now? It's from Castellamare. And, and Ben, you can get the, the siren, the old bit siren, queued <laughs> up here because the president of Italy, his mom is a Bucciolato. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so if we want to name drop. That is correct as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> so if we want to name drop here. Um, well, you, but, want, you want to laugh. It's like we're only 14,000 people, and there's more. I mean, around the world, there's many. I mean, the town itself, population is 14,000. In the summertime, it goes to about 100,000 with the tourists. But I mean the the locals. We're for fourteen and change, so that's pretty pretty um, pretty fascinating. I read somewhere, and I read this. I don't know the fact, but um, that baseball player Joey Gallo. Yes, his mother is also Castella Murdy. Oh, I mean that makes sense because you know we're going to geek out here a little bit. But we were talking about. Um, Nino Bucciolato, who was the former Capo Mafia of Castellamare, a, a cousin of my grandfather's, um, his wife, um, or I'm sorry, his mother was a Gallo. So, and I, I thought they were from Alcamo, which is which no, is, no, no, this is his mother. So the Gallo, the Gallo would be the father. His mother, I don't know his mother's last name. She's actually born in Italy. Okay, okay, but I've yeah, heard no, I've heard no. that name. I've heard of Gallo being in Castellamare and Alcamo. I guess is my. Is my point? Oh yeah, but, no, no, no. I'm I'm not doubting it with no by no means. I just yeah. don't know. Yeah, you know. I, I hadn't heard that about the baseball player. That's interesting, though. Right, the Bavetries are, are are famous from the beginning of the time. The Good Killers in the twenties. Um, what yep. were they call the Good Something Killers. Yeah, the Good Killers. I I talk about that in my book a lot, actually, because they were at war with uh -huh. the Bucciolatos. They were at war with my family. Right, it goes to show how much bullshit Joe Bonanno used, was screwing in that book. He was born, Bonanno was born in 05, am I correct? Yes. So he's born in around 05. He claims that when he was born, his birth brought an olive branch peace between the Bucciolatos and the Boventries. Like, you know, he was kind of like a mob olive branch. But the truth was they were killing each other 15 and 20 years even after here in Williamsburg and there's there's undocumented but there's some people that feel that it was actually Bernardo Mattarella that made that peace between both of them both of those clans you know and they differ in a lot of ways it, it, the Butchelaz and Boventry the Butchelaz were more like my side of the family where we were more uh, mountain people um livestock uh, hands on and and where 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 um uh, the bump branch is more and more of an educated political side of the mob if you will yeah they were more and, and, more urban i would say oh they were yeah well urban we're talking about how many miles they were from the town we were from the mountain yeah you know you have the de gregorios there's not much distance um but yeah yeah definitely yeah and you know. um i mean they talk about the the dove of peace that would have been 1905. Well, you know, that didn't really work out for my great grandfather who was killed in 1917 by the Bonventre Magadino alliance. That, that was, well, <laughs> absolutely. So that's just him trying to, and it wasn't, and he's trying to say the Bonanno family came to peace. No, it was the Bonventre family. It was your mother's side. Okay. 
the Bonanno family are good people. There's still Bonanos in my town, but they weren't um, the 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 top mob family uh, then, or even until the, even the '60s or '70s. You know, I don't I, I don't know what's going on these days. You don't hear many Bucciolados and Bonetries anymore, but um, in Italy, anyhow, and um, and 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 the, back then it was definitely not the Bonanno, the actual Bonanno last name. Yeah, so so tell us about how because of our shared history. So you you you're born in Castellamare, you moved to New York, you're going to high school there. You're you know you're interested in these movies. Well, Bushwick first, uh, but, James. Right. Okay. Bushwick first. Yeah. Let everybody know that yeah. when he's talking about New York, he's talking about Brooklyn. He he grew up in Brooklyn, and that's where a lot of this activity I actually, was. I actually lived in Brooklyn till I was about nine. Okay. Uh, the Knickerbocker Avenue uh, area. And there was many Sicilians back then, but the but the neighborhood I said it before started deteriorating, and you know with the blackouts we had uh, the looting, the the uh, people leaving, the white flight, if you will, the term that's used a lot in uh, in, in the South um, while, while I lived there, and, and and that was going on. So we moved on to the neighboring town of Ridgewood, which was. Bushwick and Ridgewood bordered each other. One was in Queens, one was in Brooklyn. We moved right over. And it seemed like most of the Sicilians that were in Bushwick for a very long time moved over with us as well. And this was considered Bonanno territory. Now, now it, get, it might get confusing because thus far, Frank and I have been talking about the Bonanos as the actual family, the, the, the genealogical family. Now I'm transitioning to talking about Bonanno as the crime family in New York. And so similar, right. but not synonymous, okay. synonymous terms. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to confuse anybody. It's, it's like, I feel like I'm talking to you all the time to understand each other. <laughs> And I apologize about it. No, no worries. But yeah, by, by, by 19, we came here in 1972. So as far as back to Bonanno, the leader of the Bonanno family, he was sent on his way to Arizona at that time. So he, we never got to see him. It, we, we, the new bosses came around. Um, they had, they had like two or three bosses change around that time. You had the Abela guy, um, the Shaka Diamond. guy. Right, Shaka, and then you had Homeboy coming out of jail in '74. Carmine Galante. <laughs> Carmine <yeah>. Galante. <laughs> and, and, and the rest, you guys know what happened from there on. Um, he was he he was on the outs with uh, Phil Ristelli, and by '79, in uh, I think it was July, if I'm not correct, he gets gunned down, or August. Yeah, just so for people that don't know. Uh, Carmine Galante was uh, Joe Bonanno's underboss and and one of his uh, top emissaries throughout the uh, 40s and 50s. Uh, went to prison in the 60s. Right. Came out of prison in the early to mid 70s, and at that about point, Joe, right uh, about 74 and 75. Well, right, I think it was 70. I think it was 74. And and Joe Bonanno right. so at that point, up. go ahead. Uh, yeah, he was out. So so. Basically, when all this war breaks out, the second war of the 60s, with the actual Joe Bonanno in power and, and, and with the with the attempt on his son's life, and, and, and it was, uh, it, they were getting demolished. They weren't winning the war, and they, and, and they just left. A lot of it took place because Carmine Galante was in jail. A lot of his um, power, a lot of his uh, goons went to the other side. They They just split up. So would would that war have occurred if Carmine Galante was around, who was a banana loyalist? Probably not. When he comes out, he's like, well, who started this war? Oh, and they're putting this guy with Steli there? I'm like, yeah, well, well, tell him, tell him I'm the boss now. Right. And for people that know the movie uh, Donnie Brasco, they, they reference uh, a, a character that you don't see, but you hear referenced on a number of occasions uh, called Rusty who's supposed to be the boss uh, that's uh, in prison. And they're referencing Phil Rustelli, who Frank has just uh, name dropped a couple of times. He was rusty. And in the mid seventies, there was this kind of jostling of power between Carmine Galante, who came out of prison, declared himself the boss of bosses in New York city. And then rusty Rustelli, who 
actually had the support of the commission in taking over the Bananos. Galante didn't. Right. And he was kind of a, a rogue, not kind of, he was a, for all intents and purposes, he was a rogue administration for, for about five years until he was assassinated in 1979 by his own army of young Zips, young Sicilians, who he thought were, you know, had undying loyalty to him. And in reality, they they sold him out. And that was part of the story that we're telling here about the rise of the, the Sicilian faction uh, in the Bonanno crime family. Yeah, two of my favorite scenes uh, uh, from Donnie Brasco. First of all, with, when he's like, that's Rusty's money. <laughs> Michael yeah. Madsen is uh, playing lefty, or I mean, uh, Sonny, Sonny Black. Black. And then uh, when they fight, he reads the newspaper, lefty Al Pacino's like, they whacked the fucking boss. Another thing I'm left out of. <laughs> yeah, they whacked the fucking boss. <laughs> oh, that, that whole zip thing is pretty, uh, now, it's pretty, I don't know. It depends on what, what reporters reported on Zip. Those guys were here all the time. They had the names back home. They weren't being shipped here by Carmen Galante. They were just kids that had know-how. And people, you know, and he told them, hey, start coming around. It wasn't, you know, it's a little Hollywood-esque, that whole, yeah, we, we sent this guy and that guy to come, you know, be our bodyguards. He he loved, he loved, he loved that. His daughter even said it in one of them, um, one of the documentaries we were on, the first one, she said, my dad loved everything about it, being from the other side. So he, he took, he took um, these guys in, like, for, for example, because he felt they were, they were more loyal. Yes, and, and you're right. It did bite him in the ass, big time. And Carmen Galante was Castellamarese, too. So he had the, it, yes, you know. The... Yes, he was. he was. He was from Castellamarese as well. Right. And he, that's, that's why you had that, uh, that soft spot for the, for the Castellamarese people. Right, and well, frankly, especially two bodyguards. Wouldn't you also say though, if, if we're if we're looking back and and you know Monday morning quarterbacking it, if you will, uh, that it wasn't a situation in '79, like you said, July of '79, Galante is famously uh, gunned down in in the uh, uh, in a restaurant in Brooklyn. Uh, his right. his dead body is is uh, photographed with a cigar in his mouth you know they called him lillo or or the cigar cuz he was famously always chewing on a cigar and it was a, a image that no, was lillo was rough for camilo okay but there was a, yeah, the, the, was the image of him lying dead on the patio of that restaurant with a cigar in his mouth got you know blasted around the world it's one, sure, of, the more one, of, the famous, one uh, of the more famous yeah, mob iconic. murder yeah. images ever. Uh, but me and, my he, friends, me and my friends later on that later became like the Janini crew, whatever guys we hung out with, kids I grew up with. We used to practice like <laughs> we used to practice like uh, cadavers, bodies that famous hits. Yeah, so a recreate, friend of mine like, had actually like we, had. We would recreate batting stances <laughs> on, well, on the baseball know, the diamond. These guys are recreating before. old mob hits. Yeah. Right. Well, I've done that too. I'm a big <laughs> baseball fan, but you, you know the you, you know the chalk lines, homicide uh, images. Yeah. yeah. So we we used to get drunk and do that. And a friend of mine had a barber chair in his apartment. He obviously, he cut hair. <laughs> we did the Anastasia, the Castellano. We did them all. But I'm I'm, I'm interested to get your insight. So like, who am I now? You know what I mean? We were young. <laughs> so not only did Galante alienate himself from the commission and the other bosses in, in the New York mafia, he alienated himself from his own family by surrounding uh, himself with these young, uh, younger guys. You know, he was in his sixties. Uh, the guys that he was surrounding himself with were all well, in their twenties. You know, he was in jail half of his life. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he chose that to alienate himself from his family long time before that but he was really close to one of his daughters nina and she used to drive him around he was a ballsy guy she drove him around more than the bodyguards uh, you know uh the bodyguards were like when he was around men and stuff like that so he really didn't think he was uh he probably he, he said it one time nobody's gonna kill me they wouldn't dare yeah, he you had know? a lot of he had a lot of hubris. Miscalculation, sure. a, a pretty uh, fatal miscalculation. <laughs> a pretty uh, huge, um, uh, yeah, miscalculation and just a, a bad call for uh, someone yeah, he, that, he that was, really a real mean bastard. Yeah, 
someone um, that that's life life depended on keeping his finger on the pulse. Right. When you start to misread that pulse is is when you end up. I remember up in, me and Jackie the talking talking about Dead. Carmine Galanti. And Jack DeRoche is a captain, you know, he's a captain in the Colombo family. We were talking about him. And he goes, So Jack DeRoche is uh, captain at one time was Charlie Moose, P- uh, Panessa. And he goes, We're walking down the street, and here comes fucking Lilo driving by. He goes, Come on, let's get out of here. This motherfucker's crazy. They, they didn't want to get in conversations with him or nothing. He wouldn't, he wouldn't care what family you were in. He was like, Hey, you want to go do this for me? Or what? You know what I mean? Charlie Moose Panarella. Hey, you're, you're, you, you, uh, you're like, you have like a, a Forrest Gump quality. You, uh, he was everywhere. Ended up kind of was. bumping in and rubbing <laughs> elbows and inter- interacting with a lot of the, the, uh, all time, uh, you know, greats in the New York mob. I mean, you, you reference. No, I, it's not, it's not like I run into that. I mean, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't so call call it a Forrest. It's my family. You know, these people, some of them. Yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, they won't come close to you. I mean, my roommate in jail was uh, Ali Boy Persico. Um, so you're, you're talking about the Columbos about- here. Jackie DeRoss was part of the Colombo administration with the Persicos. He was convicted of killing Wild Bill Cotolo uh, in 1999. Who was Wild Bill Cotolo. Right. Uh, Danny, uh, Dino Calabro. Dino Calabro. And Jackie, This I think this is a good... Um, <laughs> a good explanation of how ruthless this world is. You know, Jackie DeRoss was best friends with Wild Bill, and we stood up at his wedding. And uh, yeah, I know, I know. I, I you know, I, I hope I don't get. I, I, you know, obviously Bill Junior doesn't like him, and I can understand that. I wouldn't want like anybody who killed my somebody in my family as well. But I got along with Jackie, and I got along with Allie very well. Hey, I'm not. I'm not. Hey, that's the. That's what they signed up for. We've talked about Wild Bill uh, on this. The other day, it's job description. It's, yeah, what the right. fuck? It's the mob. And, 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 and Wild Bill had, had tried to do the same thing uh, years yeah. or years earlier. The, the Columbos were, you know, in, in, the, in the parlance of uh, the mafia, they were smart to uh, let Wild Bill think that, you know, bygones were bygones. And they named him underboss. Bill thought that that promotion was you know, cementing his status as a future Don. Uh, in reality, it was just a way to get him to lower his guard. And they knew that if uh, Persico was was off the street, because at that time, Allie, uh, little Allie Boy was going to prison. Uh, I believe that summer, it was the summer of 99, Allie Boy had to uh, report to prison. Yeah, he said something when he came back. They found a gun in Allie Boy's uh, boat in Miami, and yeah. he was supposed to turn himself in at the time. And uh, while Bill had made the mistake of saying something that the per- Persico faction definitely did not want to hear out of his mouth and was, don't worry, I'll take care of things while you guys are gone. Right. What do you mean? Like last time? So that's when he went to somebody, apparently, and I don't know nothing about this. I know as much as like um, hearing about it because I, I, I'm, I'm going to be very honest. I've never, ever, and I lived with this guy for a year. And when you live with somebody in a, in a jail cell for a year, you know, you could say, well, he said this one and that. He never said anything. So we never had crime, mob criminal talks or nothing like that, you know. But so I heard this shit from other people. Yeah. And and pe- back to that. And he said something like, uh, I'll take care of it. And they said that Ali didn't like that. And and, and he said to somebody, uh, well, uh, he's got to go now. Well, they knew they knew that if Wild Bill was left to his own devices and Persico was off the street, that. Wild Bill was just going to take over the crime family and, and the Persico reign would have been over with. So they had a couple months before Alley Boy went to prison and they decided to use those couple months to get rid of their problem. Yeah. Uh, right. And, 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 they, and, their hit was, and their hit was given to Dino, who's also, uh, we spoke about this. Well, he's my cousin, obviously. His, uh, his mom is my first cousin and she's a Fertilino as well. But um, he's Castello Mideas as well. Yeah. For, I want to just get, throw out a pop culture uh, reference for for people, um, just to give people some touchstones here that m- might not be able to keep up with all the names. But you know, little Alley Boy Persico, who we were just talking about, who was one of Frank's uh, cellmates, um, and was a was is a, a mafia don high, high ranking dude. But yeah. if you if you think of the the show The Sopranos, and you go to Little Carmine now. It, Little Carmine was 
was dumb. <laughs> and little yeah, alley boy alley is boy not dumb. The dumb. But there's no, a but yeah. there was a parallel in the sense that that whole storyline with the Lupertazzi crime family and Carmine Lupertazzi and trying to pass the the family on to yeah, his the son and the war breaking out it was all based on the Columbos and little alley boy's father Carmine Jr. Persico was the 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 patriarch of this mob dynasty which is really the last mob dynasty in America it still exists today to an yeah, extent um, I guess I never seen it that way but uh, now that you brought it to my touch, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, because I, I also, uh, I, I didn't enjoy The Sopranos when I was on the street. Obviously, when I flipped and then I gave it a shot, it was really good. Pretty accurate. Yeah, so when you when you were on the street, what didn't you like about it? It, it brought too much attention, or what, what was it that rubbed you the wrong way about it? I remember I remember being with Vito Grimaldi at the time, and uh, God rest his soul, and he goes, I was watching that show. He goes, I ain't going to watch that shit. <laughs> he goes, why? Eh, I don't want to watch it. He just didn't say why, because that's who he was. But you know why? Because it was like uh, mob shit. They throw so, a mirror uh, up to guys. They don't want to, they don't want to see what's uh, in the, ref they don't want to see the reflection in the mirror. I mean. Yeah, but six, it, it's funny. I think uh, like six weeks after, he goes, I got to admit, I watched it the other night. It wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there you go. There yeah. you go. That's 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 funny. And then Grimaldi is a name that we actually you did an episode yeah. with John Panisi recently about the 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 funeral right. situation. People can go back and watch our video or listen to our episode. Uh, let me ask you, Frank. I know we're we're all over the place, but uh, something that's interesting to me, something in my research uh, that I'm very interested in, again, is this differentiation between Sicilian members of a American crime family, no, usually referred to as Zips, and the Italian American members. And as Scott and you just talked about, we we know that there was tension between Galante and 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 Ristelli. but um, that that tension can continued throughout the '90s with Messino and others. And so, can you can you talk to us about what and it exists today in the it maybe not so much in the Bananos, but in the Gambinos oh, the right Gambinos, now. Yeah, you have a. Uh, it's not a situation that's going to break out into a war, no. but you have the Sicilian faction of that crime family taking control of the administration since the the Gaudis have been off. Uh, yeah, out Menino of the and those guys, and those guys yeah. are close to the families of Palermo. Um, I'm going to be honest with that one. I, I don't know much about it, but I, I I'm just going to give you an opinion on that. Uh, there was so much wear and tear on that family that even the guys were like that been there since the '70s. And some of them since the 60s, you know, they're probably gone now. I said, we need to bring this back where it was, okay? This is fucking ridiculous. We have, uh, you know, uh, Peter Gotti as our godfather. I mean, you know, what are we doing here? Let's, and they all, I think as a unit, they all got together and created their own cabinet, you know? So for guys on the street, like, you know, we're researching it as, as outsiders. When you're a guy on the street... I mean, well, yeah, well, serious guys. I know. I, I like the serious guys uh, that they put up there, and um, I personally know two out of three. Well, actually, three out of four. And and they put the right guys there. Serious guys, guys that were fair, guys that knew the life. Um, I would say uh, three of them went back to all the way to the old country, and their families went back. So they put the the right guys there. We're talking about I the Gambinos was, right now, right? Yeah, the Gambinos, yeah. okay? And uh, they, they did a good decision. Those guys, they, they don't mess around. They they know they how to differentiate between the outside and their inner circles. And and the Gambinos are in a good place right now. If they keep, if they, if they, if they stay the way they are, you know, and not, and not what's going on in the Bonanno family, you know what I mean? Yeah, so when, when you were on the street, I mean, were you were guys like you aware of? Oh, this guy were the Zips. These guys are the Italian Americans. Was there that kind of self awareness? Yeah, of course. Okay, expand on that. Like, like try to unpack that for our audience. Like how that? I just think sociologically that's really interesting. Um, I, I think I think these freaking stupid mob books brought that <laughs> that kind of like animosity towards the groups. That you know, a, a, a hidden one. I mean, I'll give you an example who's a gentleman and he's a good guy. It's Dominic Cefalu, 
they 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 wrote grief ball under his name, like what the fuck, like alias. I mean, I've never heard anybody call him that. Matter of fact. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, they call him Italian. I think Dom. that's good advice. <laughs> this is the, right. but the guy you're talking about is yeah, the guy who's the, 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 the Gambino elder statesman. But yeah. a gentleman, okay? I know we 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 he, he, you know he's probably pissed at me. Don't like me, but we were close in a sense of family, like friendship, not criminal. Okay, let me let me just uh, state that. But stuff like that was created by the, the media. They might have caught a, a phone tap with some buffoon saying something stupid like that. Zips, whatever. So that created that. Did we know we were the, the ones they were talking about? Of course. Yeah, because, I mean, I think we're a lot of that. I mean, who else is family talking Sicilian at all? Right. And and I think where some of that starts is we talked about the Bonanno. We're talking about the, the Bonanos, too, here and Donnie Brasco. A lot of that comes from his book when Joe Pistone says, I'll, my guys that I was with, like um, Sonny Black and them, would talk about the Zips, and they didn't like the Sicilians, and right. you can't be trust them. He'd be a friend of mine, or he'd be a friend of yours, all that crap. It's right. that fucking book league. A lot of that shit develops with with with, with pop culture. Yeah. No, I, I think that's where—I mean, that's some of the first time that I—and well, and we talked about Claire Sterling's book, Octopus, but— uh, I mean, Frank and I did off air, but but her book and Joe Pistone's book, that was some of the first time I became aware of this so-called differentiation between Zips, a.k.a. Sicilians, and the Italian-American um, guys. I hung out with Nikki Santoro, okay? Nikki Santoro Nikki Mouth. Accidentally, accidentally shoots my cousin in that three-captain uh, hit, okay? And he's uh, for he, people for fans of uh, Donnie Brasco. That's Bruno Kirby's character, and Donnie Brasco was right. was Nicky Mouth. Right. right, and and he never ever ever. Just matter of fact, he did. Any, he knew about Castello Marie's history. He was very into history. He knew about. He was always a he, in a roundabout way. He didn't say, "Well, I shot him." I said there was an accident, and I knew what he was talking about without so many words. Um, he he was always respectful. Towards the Sicilians, it's just that, you know, you get these idiots that stay home, read these books, and automatically just as, uh, assume that these people don't like each other. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting perspective to hear from Frank that, that well, well, the tensions are overstated. People, yeah, it's a perspective from people like, I, I'll give you an example. Like, my cousin Dino, he grows up in Bensonhurst, and it's tough being a first-generation uh, kid off the boat. Because the only people who get respect really to that, to that, to that, and it's always the same people doing it, the third generation, fourth generation, you know, eighth, you know, making fun of the, uh, the, the other ones, especially in Bensonhurst a lot, unless their family was connected. Then they wouldn't really say anything, you know, obviously. But like, like if their father was a bricklayer or a, a landscaper or a butcher, ah, oh, well, look at them, the grease balls, whatever. And, and, you know, that kind of like you try to alienate yourself now from being Italian. And I see my cousin Dino living in, in Bethlehem. Every time I went to visit him, I don't know, by yearly, three times a year, I would see him transform into a more of an Italian-American just to, to distance himself from the other side. Because his parent, his dad was a hardworking person, his mom, a homemaker. And, and I've seen that, you know. Yeah, and, assimilation. And that happens a lot, but within the mob, it doesn't. I like the I like the uh, the Nikki Santoro anecdote. Um, What's that? The, the just you were talking about Nikki Mouth, and then we're, we're uh, just letting the viewers or listeners know that he was Bruno Kirby in the movie. Uh, oh yeah, he was Bruno Kirby. I always tell in, this in the story. movie Bra Donnie Brasco. So I catch him one day at the bar. I go, what's going on? I go, what's going on, Nikki? So he has like his hand on the bar and he's tapping and he's pissed. He really don't get pissed. He was friendly, funny as shit. I go, what's the matter? You know that fucking movie. I go, what movie? He goes, you know, that fucking Donnie Cocksucker Brasco movie. <laughs> I said, <laughs> but I still got, I'm visualizing my book this, uh, this, 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 uh, this scene. I'm like, what the fuck? So I go, what happened? Because well, when they were filming, I told them, listen, if you're going to film anything here, I got to know about it. You got to come see me first. So they said, okay, okay. And they just kept on filming, right? So 
the Bruno Kirby guy, they had him killed in the movie, right. and they make him, and his name is Nicky, and they make him seem like he was a rat. And right. fuck it, that Nick, Nick Santoro, they did that on purpose. He was fuming, boy. But was he it, was mad. You know what's, was so, it was interesting, though, is to think that from that group of people, uh, Sonny Black, Lefty, Nicky, and that whole... 30, 30, 30 years later, the guy that became... I mean, he didn't become boss. He became underboss. But the, the Bruno Kirby character, that's the guy that has the future as an administrator. Yeah. I mean, Sonny Black gets uh, well, killed. Okay. That, Lefty yeah, not, ends not up... Not the Dramatino days. No, but I'm saying Nikki... Uh, no, I know. But but uh, in the 2010s, Nikki Mouth rose to the point where he was uh, an yeah. underboss. Yeah, okay. I mean, no, kind of no, funny. I know. Uh, I, I know, yeah. I know. But, I mean, what was left of the Bonanno family at that point? They... they they made a little resurface uh, again. Uh, I get it. But right there between 2004 to about 2008, 2009, or 10, uh, they were looking shabby. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. look so great you right now. Remember, when I was <laughs> yeah. looking at when my indictment, there was 90 people. Okay? There was 90 people. And... and um. About five captains flipped, an underboss, and then later a boss. So, I mean, what could be left? Yeah. Yeah, the damage is done. I mean, yeah, t talk to our audience about that if if uh, you don't mind. Like, when, when you were on the street, like, your interactions with some of the guys that people, names they'll know. Joe, Joe Messino, Messino right. you know, the, the, really the last godfather of New York City. I mean, yeah. guy was, right. uh, so, was a superpower. So yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you, uh, well... Around March of um, fuck. March of 2002, they arrest 14 Manano guys. They arrest 14 guys. They, they have arrest. They already at this point. I don't know if he blew trial yet or he was about to. Spiro was the only one that was higher rank, looking at life, and you know they tried to flip him. He didn't flip, so they arrested 14 more Manano guys. So they arrested TG. Uh, Robert Lino, I'm naming the bigger guys. Um, Casaletto, Grimaldi, Grimaldi's son, uh, Joe, uh, fuck, who else? And Robert Lino. And Big Louie uh, 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 Big Louis Louis. flip, too. Big Louie who? Uh, James Tart that, Tartaglioni. Yeah, you went about a year after. Okay. So we get in, and none of us flip. There's 14 of us. None of us flip. And we go to October 23rd, a new indictment, two proceedings. They bring in another 23. This is the, this is the big one. Canarella and Copa are in this one. Indictment. And within a month, they both flip. One gives two murders, the, the uh, post, the post murder of uh, Perino and, and uh, Tony Mira, his uncle. That's Canarella. Copa gives, ready for this, the Sonny Black murder. So the chains move. By 2003 in January, they bring in Messino, uh, Vitali, Danny Mangelli, later on Filicomo. And that's within that period of time, 2003, 2000, uh, Sal Vitali flips too, and Joe D'Amico. So you got four big guys flipping at this time, at, the, at this point. You got uh, D'Amico, Vitali. Canarella Copa. And when Louie, the guy you're talking about, Big Lou, finds out about this on the street, he he breaks him to the to the uh, FBI's office and says, hey, wire me up. Because these guys got the goods on me. And he flips too. Joe goes to trial. Yeah, Big Louie, just so just, just so the audience knows, Big Louie wasn't facing a case. He he foresaw that a case would be coming down the pike, but he just showed up on the FBI's doorstep and offered a wire up. Yeah, he was, in, he was living in Florida at the time, and he came in, and everybody was in jail, and at the time, Joe reaches out and says, hey, look, have a four-man panel. And he has a four-man panel of, of, of bosses. They're going to run it together, and it's uh, Joe Camerano Sr., Joe Saunders, um, Lou, Vinnie Gorgeous and Tony Green. Out of those four, the ones wearing a wire back was Big Lou. And he wears a wire 
and, and brings in another 15 guys in right after that. So you got the whole upper echelon of the Bonanno family that gets annihilated. All right. Um, Joe loses trial. Joe loses trial. I sat on Joe. He loses trial. I was the only associate, too, out of the Bonanno family to sit in that trial. And um, he gets he gets uh, he gets convicted. I think it was like eight bodies or something to that effect. And he calls for the prosecutor after he's uh, found guilty, and he makes a deal. So uh, at that point, Joe Messino becomes the highest ranking member of the New York of uh, any organized crime Italian in the United States to flip. And I, I don't agree. You know, I've I've spoken about this at length, and I'm interested to get your your take on it. I, I don't agree with that mindset or that deal. The idea that they take a boss and flip him to get the people that were underneath him. The whole point is to go up the ladder, not to go down the ladder yeah, upstream. So, well, you know, Joe Messino right now yeah, no, I agree. is, is a free man I, is a free man. He got to get out of jail free card just because he debriefed. And well, and then took down a bunch of guys practice. that were his subordinates. Well, this uh, okay. All right, back to that. They wanted him also to bring people around them or unsolved murders or or bodies that were uh, at places that their families wanted to know where they were. And you know, like he want he want whatever whatever who was the boss at uh, Barney whoever. They, if he could have gave him anything about anybody that was good for them, and and he he gave a, he gave a lot. He even um, unearthed a couple of bodies out in Howard Beach, if you remember. I'm not saying that you can't close cases and you can't get your promotions and get your headlines. I, I understand. Believe me, I understand the motivation me, from though. a That's prosecutorial I mean, perspective. Yeah. I'm just saying I don't agree with it. You're going to yeah. know a lot of stuff. Yeah, you're saying more, Scott. You're saying morally, you ethically, you find it. Yeah, I, see, I understand th what their motivation is. I yeah. get it. Crazy. Yeah. We're trying to figure out who's more. Yeah, are the, are the government lesser of the two evil? Yeah, but at the same time, some of these government people want to get to higher places, and 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 uh, Joe Messino could give them a lot. He did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean they're going after Donald Trump, ain't they? Well, he's a boss. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, based so the what you just described. The, the administration, it's it's damaged. Um, and so that's where we get to the point where eventually Vinnie Gorgeous goes to prison. And Vinny, then we, and Vinnie Gorgeous got tangled up because he's meeting with Joe Messino, right. who's his boss, right. his superior, and not realizing Messino had flipped and he had wired up on Bastiano. Right. So well, well Joe Messino was half of Vinnie Bastiano's problem. The other half was this guy that used to come to our co-defendant meetings called up. He was a lawyer called Tommy Tony Lee. And he was this ambitious lawyer, little guy. He was wanting to be half a gangster, half bank. When they broke him, he was looking at like five years. He they disbarred him and he talked like a like he sang like an opera singer, okay? <laughs> but he was sending messages back and forth from um uh, Messino to uh to, to Vinny. So that was big. And then eventually, of course, they were in the same prison. They had them together on that wire thing where um, Joe Messina wore a wire on Vinny. But those three, I would love to read those, those, those transcripts and 302s because I think that was going on for a minute. You know, I'll give you a scenario. Uh, Joe calls me to the side and he goes, uh, Frankie, I, I, uh, you, know, you know this kid... He was a kid in, in my neighborhood, grew up um, a little younger than me. I said, yeah, I know. What about him? He goes, I said, I, you know, he'd get in trouble sometimes. But he was a good, he, well, he was a tough kid. When I mean a good kid, he listened. Uh, not that he was a good person. You know, it's the mob. <laughs> so right. I said, no, he's a good guy. I said, I didn't think nothing of it. So at this point, I was the only associate at these meetings and everything. He's actually telling me that. Well, a friend of mine is asking about him. What's, what's, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't get it. He's telling me he wants to make this kid. But I think it was like a little bit out of my fucking, uh, to him even bringing that shit up with me. You know what I mean? And this was Joe Messino brought this up with you? Yeah, yeah. At one point we got close. And, he, you know, when anybody had to talk, he would say, don't worry about it. We could talk. 
you know, when I was there, because everybody was made, you understand? Yeah. I would be in a co-defender meeting with uh, Willie Riviello, uh, Ron Willie Cla- Dino, Willie Donnie, Glasses. Danny Mangelli, um, Dirty Danny. Joe, and then me. Yeah, then maybe somebody else I'm missing, but that was it. Because we were looking at a lot of, you know, the the the, the worst of the crime. Um, so, you know, and, and I was like, it went over my head. And actually, kid, I could say what it was. It was uh, Ace Iel they were asking about. Yeah, yeah. he's he's a uh, he's a guy that's locked. Life. Yeah, he's locked up now. But right, he, asked co- me, he asked me if he's okay. They were they were making him. You understand? You know, I know. And, and what I'm saying, what I've heard is that when he comes out of prison, he's on the fast track to uh, you know kind of admin administration that they like him a lot. He's a good kid. His dad's doing 200 years. I, yeah. I, I, we have the same godparents. Um, I know him all my life. He was my neighbor. Uh, I think I discussed that with you one time on um, Nadu. He's not related to Ernest Ayala. Right. Ernie, uh, Ernie Ayala just got caught up in the whole funeral. I, I don't even know who he is. Brawl. Um, but uh, Anthony obviously was, was, was that one time like family. Might still be family with my family. I don't talk to my family. But um, yeah, yeah. So he was discussing that with me. And, and, and that's where I was at at the time. So when all like, these. Yeah, he's a good kid. And they made him. Uh, uh, Vinny wanted to have him made. When all these guys get taken down, then something that I find interesting because of my heritage and my research, things come full circle and you get Sal, the iron worker, Montana, another guy who's Castellamare. So, like, things come full circle back to. He takes over in like 2005. I think it's that they were living a fairy tale. I mean, Sal's a good kid. I remember him very well. We were in Italy together when we were younger. Um,. He was a really young guy that took over the crime family at he like 35. He was a young guy. He came yeah. out. His family was pretty legit. They were good people, you know, but they minded their business and people like that. I, I, whatever. Um, God rest his soul, you know, but uh, but I, I think they was like, oh, he's Castello Mariz, this and that. After all, if we're going to rebuild his family, you know, you know I, I said it before, 1931, it would be a good idea. Fairy tale, you know, but you see how that worked out. He got, uh, de- for people that don't know, he got yeah. deported to Canada and he went to Montreal and he tried to take over the quit. mafia in Montreal and ended up being killed in, uh, in, uh, in all the chaos that's been uh, going on over there for the last decade and a half. Well, he pulled out, you know who I am. And yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that, that was, uh, who was, who was, but- who do you think was the biggest factor like backing him to to take that position was that baldo amato was that his biggest like uh sponsor i i i I don't know i mean that poor guy's doing life um i don't want to contribute to that especially if i I don't know i think patsy from the bronx had something to do with it the poor said go over there and start running things i wouldn't mind i I wouldn't be surprised patsy patty died though i remember patty Um, i thought he had something to do with getting uh I, I could be talking out of school here. I don't consider myself an expert on the Bananos. Yeah. But I, I thought um, that faction had something to do with, with Sal getting in. What, the Bronx faction? Yeah. He was put into the Bronx faction. And yeah. it was that was a strategic move by uh, Joe Messina. And he'd probably tell you that these days as well. Um, he, 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 Bal, Baldo proposed him. That we knew. But he wasn't going to put him in the same crew with Baldo. And that's because... He always tried to uh, separate the, the the Sicilian faction, and and Baldo, and Baldo yeah, back so, to the Galante, <laughs> Baldo Amato, who would just yeah, name nothing dropped. to do with the Bronx. They, it's like Sal, you are now in the Bronx. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to tell the audience yeah. that might not have a scorecard here that uh, Baldo, who you just mentioned, was one of those guys that Carmine Galante had around him and trusted as a bodyguard. As a bodyguard, right. and then he was also one of the guys that looked the other way when a group of hitmen came in and, and gunned him down. Yeah, right. So, that, that that is true. That that you could catch that on the Narco Wars. I was on the Heron uh, Don. That was episode one. Yeah, uh, talk, season two. Yeah, let's let's take a few minutes here because we're getting close to wrapping up here. Take a few minutes here sure. to promote some of the your appearances on the National Geographic documentary narco wars which by the way I, I i really enjoy that whole series i use some of those episodes to show my students and my gangs and organized crime class and frank you've, right. a, you've appeared as an expert on a couple of episodes uh can t- talk I, to us about you. that yeah they're great t- tell the audience about that well it was about the pipeline that that 
that um, it was mostly about the Sicilian War that 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 was going on in the eighties um, about a, a certain um, Gaetano Badalamente who was head of a three man panel in Sicily at the time when the war broke out, and he had to learn how to be a drug dealer very quick and one of the biggest in the world. So with that said, then they had to look at the angle where they were getting the drugs from. And at the time with the Afghani uh, Russian war, we were, we, we were, we, the Americans were allowing a lot of access. So for that heroin to be sold to the Italians, which the Italians were buying. So they could go back and buy, uh, buy weapons to fight the Russians. Yeah, it's really an interesting example of globalization, even as early as the late 70s and 80s, because the raw opium is coming from Afghanistan, and then they, they process it into morphine, and they had labs in Sicily and, and other places, and uh, Marseille. All over the world. Yeah. When people think of labs, they think of like these big-ass Pfizer plants. No, these <laughs> things are like one little studio apartment somewhere in Aleppo back in the in, in the French Connection days, you know? Yeah, yeah it's more like Breaking Bad, <laughs> like in a trailer or something. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm oh, they have nowhere. To, the lab, they process it in these guys. I, I, I was like, no, no. That's very <laughs> elaborate. Good try. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, uh, you know, like Bay or Tylenol or something like that kind of uh, lab. But um, I'm try it right. I mean, back in, they used to go through Syria back in the French Connection days and then bring it down to uh, Syria. And then through Lebanon, uh, Lebanon, then to, uh, well, not Syria, and then Lebanon, and then the ports over there in Beirut. Yeah. And they used to go all the way down to uh, Marsilla. Yeah. It was easy to transport shit. Yeah, people. Yeah, people doing that stuff all the time. Yeah, and they could you speak the the Lebanese traffickers spoke French because Lebanon used to be a French colony so they they could speak french with the uh, corsican traffickers and the corsican guys knew the sicilians so it's a really interesting example of uh globalization but something frank points out and i i don't want to go down this rabbit hole necessarily but it's an interesting that was brought up is um the guys producing the raw opium in afghanistan are also being sponsored by the CIA and the State Department. And they even have the DEA agents in this documentary that Frank is on, where the DEA guys are saying that the orders were given to lay off, to back off, to stop investigating the Mujahideen, like the Afghan warlords who are big opium traffickers, who, by the way, <laughs> that's the son of Bin Laden. <laughs> yeah, right, which all ended up on 9 11, right? I mean, yeah. that morphed into, yeah. into Al Qaeda. And um, I think it's something that, it's something that really, I think people should be outraged about, but we, we, well, watch the night that episode. You're really going to be outraged. Yeah. When a former attorney general, um, kind of, uh, uh, signs off on that, but he's 91 years old. He don't care. Yeah. I mean, Reagan was referring to them as freedom fighters and they were really religious, drug dealers, religious <laughs> fanatics, terrorists, and, and, uh, um, drug drug dealers, and then you know eventually morphed into um, Al Qaeda. But um, yeah, Frank gives his insight. Um, you know, as someone uh, who who is uh, you know, born in Sicily and moved to New York, and so check out those episodes. Those episodes, you know, they show the reruns on on old school cable, but you can find them streaming as well. But they're um, they're they're really good um, episodes. They're yeah, done well. They're done well. Hats off to James. Um. James and Nick, Nick the director, uh, they they put it together. They're really good at what they do. Um, I, I even before I was involved with National Geographic, um, uh, they, they I always was fascinated by. I'm a documentary. I love documentaries. Um, I'm trying to work on one soon, a six part. But uh, yeah. So it's, I I I like their work. It was done really well. Yeah, some of the uh, they've got an episode on um. Rizzuto in Montreal. They've got an episode on Galante, which Frank is part of. They've got an episode on um, Long John in Hunter Philly. Rano, yeah. That's a great, that's, that was I've a great that episode. Yeah, that um, they've got episodes on like uh, Frank Lucas and the African-American dudes in Harlem. Uh, I mean, it's, they got a whole season on the Latino drug cartels, Pablo and, and El Chapo. ones in Chinatown as well. Yeah, yeah. So it covers, it's similar to like what we like to do with our show. Like it's not just about the Italians or just about the the right. Latin guys, they they cover the whole 
uh, the whole spectrum. So it's a really great series. And then, and well, I I don't I I don't I can't really say much now because everything's in the preliminary stage now. But Frank and I are working on a project, trying to get something off the ground. We can't really say much about it right now because it's still in its infancy. But Frank has got some great yeah. ideas, and I'm trying to help him. Uh, and maybe we could collaborate it, it, on something. It's different. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. definitely definitely different. But everything I'm hearing from from people in the industry is that it's a great idea, and I agree. So. Um, uh, you'll see. I think you're going to see a lot more Frank in the future with different media projects. So um, yeah, I'm putting myself out a little bit more these days. So yeah. uh, I'll be out a little bit more. But uh, I love your stuff. I've seen you guys. Uh, your stuff. Your stuff's great. I, I love your um, history angle, James. Yeah, and, I appreciate and, that. And, 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 yeah, both of you guys. I, I love. I love your stuff. I really do. Especially when it comes to the Detroit mob. Yeah, you're well. People like yourself, you're just invaluable, invaluable resources for people like us and and our audience. And you know, we couldn't do what we do without being able to pick the brains of people like yourself. Yeah, oh, good job. <laughs> yeah, we, and so is there any way uh, people can find you? Do, you? do you have like I can't remember? Do you have like um, anything you want to plug, like social media or website or anything? Um, no, 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 no. I mean, um. Not, not, nothing right now. Okay. I mean, eventually, which is good. Um, I, I, I hopefully we'll be starting another, uh, another six episodes for next year of, uh, the National Geographic, um, y- you know, series of the Narco Wars, and we'll go from there. It, 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 and till then, um, a couple other projects that we, we, me and you were working on one. I got one with Tom Levesque here, and, um, and uh, Nadu, my my little buddy Nadu. Yeah, we're yeah we're friends with both of those. Tom and Jeff both have their own shows, and they they support us, and we yeah, support them. Let me tell you something. I I don't I don't really gravitate to anybody who's uh, if I if I don't if I, I, I if I, I think it's an art too to talk about history. You you, you need to 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 reach out to your people, and you got to be honest. You know what I mean? And and that kid that kid's going to play. He's he's pretty good at what he does. Yeah, we like we like both of those guys, and I I know you're going to talk and Tom as well. And Tom as well. The old C shorts guy. I haven't I haven't caught up with him on anything lately, but uh, you I, know um, he I like him too. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've heard of that, but I don't. I've never like interacted with. I think it's another show out mm. there, another video cast. But um, but we know. Uh, we know Jeff. He's been on our show. Scott goes on his show all the time. We consider him. He's a big fan of ours. He always plugs our stuff. We appreciate that. And and Tom too. I've talked to him. He he always shouts us out. He's a good dude as well, a supporter of our show. So we we encourage our audiences to listen and follow. Uh, you know their their programs as well. Um, all right, Frank. We're gonna I wrap be, up. I might be missing a couple of people, but I mean, yeah. All fan. Uh, those those are a couple of my favorites. Yeah, and we and we'll shout out Frank and I are friends with some of our paisan out there like Angelo and Eric and Tony, the guys we talked oh, to. Please do. Please, Scott please knows those guys do. too. Uh Angelo. Yeah, and Griff, all those guys. So what up? They, they listen to our show. So uh make sure everyone out there, please follow us on social media. Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, follow our YouTube channel. Frank, I'm gonna stay in touch with you. Obviously, we're working on some things, but we really appreciate your time, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, you guys always uh, bring it. Uh, I love it. All right. You take care, Frank. For the Original Gangsters podcast, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. Take care. Thanks.